A warm welcome to you. Glad you're here this morning. Time to get started. I'm glad to have those who are watching from wherever you are and whenever you are. We're thankful through the technology that you can be a part of the class this way and hope it will be a blessing to you, perhaps to many others off in the future. I know I'm wearing a floral pattern shirt with a striped jacket. It's, it, it's meant to disorient you, so you'll lose track of time and, uh, and I can go, maybe go longer, maybe you won't hear the bell ring, I don't know. Um, I know I, you, you thought this day would never come when we'd actually be starting another book, but we did finally finish Romans after 77 studies, but I, I meant to tell you this. Um, and, and I forgot there at the end of the, of the Roman study, but I came across this recently. I saved it at the time. It was quite a while ago and recently found it again. But I read that uh, John Piper, a well-known evangelical preacher, did a series through Romans. And this is the graphic that I saw where it says that he did, if you can see this here, he did 225 lessons <laughs> through, uh, right there, I think, right there, 225 sermons through preaching through the book of Romans between, uh, not sure why, I can't, I can't, there, I can enlarge it there, between 1990, from the spring of 1998 to the end of 2006. So I don't feel quite, it's bad taking 77 classes to cover Romans. And again, Richard, remind us again how long you guys did it up there in Fort Worth. It's three years. Oh, three years. So they did it for three years. All right. Well, covered it all. One last little fun thing. <laughs> and, and did you finish the book? Did you cover it all? Well, I don't. We didn't cover it as deeply as we <laughs> Well, all right. But I didn't know Hebrew and Greek. Well, here... Um, Here's a little image I wanted to share with you. Now, Kim and the mother-in-law and Jamie, our daughter and Teddy went to Galveston and she texted me this picture. And so I just wanted to share this with you that uh, this is my wife and uh, my mother-in-law. So um, <laughs> uh, I can do this because they're not here this morning. There was a little problem with uh, getting Teddy and everybody ready in, in time to be here, but you can insert your own mother-in-law joke there. Uh, I, I guess I need to wait till she's not in town anymore, but I just, there's... <laughs> can, <clears throat> I'm, I'm just going to leave it there. Uh, I'm not going to say the little funny that I want to say so badly, but I'm not going to say it, but... Okay, yeah, I know, I know. But if I were to just show that to you and say, uh, I've got a picture of my wife and my mother-in-law here. I just, I just got to, all right, I better move on. I better move on. Uh, so I want to pray with you, of course, and I hope you'll bear with me a little bit since we're starting 1 Corinthians uh, like I did when I began the Introduction to the Gospels class, I had a special prayer about that class because uh, just as we were then, we're, we're starting a journey, we're moving into a new area of study. It's, it's sort of an epic moment for me. Uh, it's a big shift in my mind and in my thinking, in my orientation to move now into this new material for our study. And so I want, I want to ask for for, uh, I don't mean to pray so much for myself, but I do want to ask for the Lord's blessings to be on me as I teach. So I'm gonna say some things along those lines, but, uh, and certainly we wanna rem remember uh, Linda and Robert and the Baker family. I know we're, we're, we sorrow with them, but we're so thankful finally. And I know we'll mention this again at the worship hour, but we're so thankful that finally his uh, suffering is over finally. Bob is with the Lord after such a long ordeal, uh, and we'll pray about that as well. So let's go to our Heavenly Father. <clears throat> Dear God, great Father in heaven, we praise your name, and we lift up our voices together as one 
to give you glory, to praise our Lord Jesus, to thank you for your goodness and your grace, for your love and mercy that you've poured out on us so richly in your Son, for our fellowship together in the gospel, for the blessing of being your servants in your church here at League City, and for the wonderful privilege of being able to meet together like this and open your word and study it. And as we do so, Father, we know there are those in our midst who are dealing with heavy burdens in their lives. And right now, uh, we know the bakers are suffering loss. And we ask for your comfort to be on Linda and Robert and the whole family. Lord, draw them near to you and to each other and grant them your mercy in this time of need. Mm -hmm. We're so thankful for the loving way in which Linda took care of Bob for so long and for how you blessed the church through them and through their marriage and their faithful service. And we know that will continue to bless the church for many years to come. And we rejoice in Bob's hope in Christ that you have given to all of us, Lord, and that we have victory over the sin and suffering and the death that we face in this fallen world and that we can Face all things, Father, with joy and confidence because of what you've done for us in Christ. And as we go to this letter, Lord, that you had Paul write to the church in Corinth so long ago, we ask that you would open our hearts to your word and increase our faith and our understanding of who you are and what your will is for us and for your church as we strive to serve you together with one heart and one soul. And Father, I ask that you bless me in my own study and in my teaching, that I would teach your word faithfully, Father, speak only your truth, that you would grant me and all of us discernment as we struggle with some of the difficult text in this book and we think of how to apply them to what we are facing right now as your people. Father, bless me to speak your word with love and humility with mercy and compassion, to speak it with boldness and power, with fear and trembling, and that your hand might be upon me so that I can give faithful exposition of your truth and that we might all be able to see the light of your glory that you've revealed to us in Christ and in the gospel of Christ and that we read about, Father, in your word. Thank you for giving us your word. Thank you for all who suffered and sacrificed to preserve your word and to, to copy it, to translate it, and that it has come down to us and that we have it in our hands, Lord. May we be faithful stewards of it. May we be diligent students of it. May we hold forth the word of light for the for the salvation of souls, Father, and for your glory. So we ask all these things, Father, and for your, for your blessings, for your will to be done in our lives and in all things, now and forever, through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Okay, I'm, I'm really excited about this image that I made as our title slide. And, uh, and so remember, by the way, as we start this journey, uh, when we look back years later, when we finish, remember this historic day, where you were, what you were doing when we started first, first Corinthians. I couldn't decide whether, at first I did this uh, solid black background, but then I decided, decided to go more with the Greek uh, and with the sort of Corinthian look with the marble background. So um, I was thinking with the, the title I wanted to give to the class, taking Paul's language from the early chapters here, especially chapter one about Christ, chapters one and two about Christ crucified as the power and wisdom of God. I wanted to show Christ crucified, but I didn't want an image that was too explicit or graphic or too, or that showed um, Jesus' face too directly. So I tried to give it a lot of thought and I looked for a lot uh, I looked for a long time and I looked at a lot of images, so I found that image and, um, and was able to extract it from its background. And then the other one is this, this breathtaking statue that is supposed to be the Apostle Paul outside of a cathedral in Sicily. Uh, I believe I have that. And so I was able to extract that from the background because... Paul is talking here about Christ crucified and how he preached Christ crucified. So I wanted Paul in a powerful gesture of 
preaching, a proclamation, and, uh, and juxtaposed with, the, with Christ crucified. And you can see the Corinthian column back there as well that fits well with what we're doing. So that's why I came up with that. I just wanted you to know there was some thought that, and work that went into that because I, I think it helps sort of brand it in our minds. In fact, now as we go into the points we're going to look at in our introduction as we start the introduction to the class, that's a, that's a Corinthian column that I'm using. So I just want you to know why, what, what's, what, why would I choose that image for this class? And I don't know if you know the difference. Anyone know their classic uh, architecture, the difference between a Corinthian column and a, um, other columns? This, here you go. We're going to have a little architecture lesson. So this is the, uh, this is the Doric style here. Okay, and then the uh, ionic. This is all going to be on, is Rose here? This is all going to be on the test, Richard. So uh, that's the ionic. And then this is the Corinthian with the um, acanthus leaves. You can see um, it's more ornate. It has more detail, and the Romans preferred that style and used it frequently in their, their architecture. That's, you see the difference there between the Doric, the plain, Doric and the Ionic, and, uh, and look how breathtaking and beautiful that, that kind of architecture is. So you might notice that now and say, oh, well, I don't remember anything from Tyler's class on 1 Corinthians, but I remember something about the columns that are cool. So, well, the first thing I wanted to do with you, this might be interesting to you, and maybe we should do this every time we begin a New Testament book. Um, You'll see what I mean in a minute about looking at the chronology of the books. But I want us to think about the canonical context. What do we mean by canon, the word canon? That's the, the term used for the scriptures that have been accepted as inspired by God and collected into our Bibles that we count as scripture. And the word the term originally meant to, uh, came to mean um, to, to measure and so it's the idea of looking at the ancient documents and by what measure or standard would we say this is a book that belongs in the Bible. So that word canon then comes to be used for the, the contents of Scripture, I guess you could say, or what we have in the Bible. So when we say the canonical context, we mean when we open 1 Corinthians, where are we in the Bible? Well, of course, we're in the New Testament, and we can break down the New Testament documents. We have... These different, sometimes these would be referred to as different genres. And then you can break these down even into subgenres, uh, parts of the Gospels. And we did a little bit of that in the introduction to the Gospels class. But you have, sometimes you'll see it this way in diagrams and charts. I made this one because I wasn't really happy with any of the ones that I found. The, the Gospels. So we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Biography. They tell us that's a, that's a very simplistic way to, to, to classify them, but uh, that's good enough for our purposes. So we have the record of the, the life, the ministry, the death, the resurrection of Christ. And then the book of history of the establishment and the expansion of the church in Acts that we're looking at on Wednesday nights right now. And then we have the letters written to the church or the epistles. It's a word that just refers to letters, uh, means letter. And then Revelation is classified by itself as an apocalypse. And of course, it is a, a highly unique book in Scripture. But when we look at the epistles, we can break them down further into Paul's letters. Since the Lord used Paul to write nearly one-third of the New Testament, used Paul to write so many of the books of the New Testament, we can separate his and classify his over against the others that are called the general epistles, right? That would be, uh, now some would put Paul, would put Hebrews as one of Paul's letters. And all this will be uploaded, by the way, in the file that you can access with the link in the description if you're watching this. I finally, I have all of the class files uploaded for Romans. All the material is there. I'm way behind on Acts. I feel like it's almost hopeless that I could ever get caught up, but I'm, I'm going to try. And I haven't been able to upload the last few, in case you're wondering, the last few videos from our Acts class. I just have had some health issues and really have had some bad weeks and some bad days. And once I got behind on a few classes, it, it got very difficult to try to, to 
to keep up, so I'll probably resume this Wednesday, and, and there'll be a gap in the, the videos that I, I don't know if I'll ever be able to go back. It's very time consuming doing the editing and uploading, so I apologize for that, but if you're watching and wondering, well, where have the Axe class has been, uh, I'll try to resume that as soon as possible. But, um, but so all this will be available later. If you, and there's a lot, you might have a study Bible and you've got diagrams like this. You can Google this and there's a wealth of information like this available, obviously, on the internet. But some would say Paul wrote Hebrews. I'm not convinced of that. It's an interesting study. But James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd and 3rd John and Jude would be the general letters. And then we can break Paul's down even further. Okay, so we're in... First and Second Corinthians is what we're starting. So you have Galatians, uh, likely as first letter, and then First and Second uh, First and Second Thessalonians, First and Second Corinthians, Romans. See, we've already studied Romans, and now we're going to First Corinthians. But then you have his what are called his prison epistles, and not everyone breaks them down this way. There are different ways that you could. Um, separate and distinguish Paul's letters, but I think this is a good way and this is a common way. The, the prison epistles that he wrote uh, upon his first arrest that we read about at the end of the book of Acts. And then the, the letters to the preachers here, 1 Timothy, Titus, 2 Timothy, does anyone know what those are called in biblical studies? What? Yeah, the pastoral epistles because people think of you know, the common conception is since they were preachers, they were pastors. We just did a series on elders and we made that distinction. Not all preachers are pastors. The preacher is not the overseer of the church, like the, the sort of the denominational pastor system. But it, it is a common word used. And so I think it's legitimate to use it to refer to, and you'll hear me say that sometimes, refer to uh, First and Second Timothy and Titus, Paul's pastoral letters. Uh, written to those preachers. Now, think of the order in which these books come. Because we open our New Testament, right? And it makes sense to start with Matthew and the genealogy and birth of Christ. And it just seems like, well then, I guess so the Lord had Matthew write and then the other gospel writers and then, and then we got to what happened after that. And so he had Luke write that book. And then later he had these letters written to the church. But really, what would be, I'm going to put these in order. Now, this is the first time I've ever done this in a class. It was an interesting study for me. And it took a while to make this. So uh, you need to appreciate it, Richard. I want you to be impressed. I want to hear some ooh and aahing uh, over the, my scrolling graphic here. What would be first? What's, what do we think is the very first book that was written of the New Testament documents? Okay, well, of the Gospels, I will say Mark. But I think before Mark was even written, anyway, so this would be like a game show thing where you've got, or you could have your little card out and you could check off as we go through them. All right, so I'll give you the first one here. All right, James is likely the earliest New Testament document, very early. See, that, that comes as a, a surprise to a lot of people because it's, it's late in the canonical order. That's what we mean, the canonical order, meaning in the order in which we have them arranged in our, in our Bibles. So then after James, after James, so you have the church now without the written word, without the full New Testament documents revealed, recorded, and circulated, and so these documents are gradually being copied and circulated. So what, what comes next? Well, uh, we mentioned in our class in the book of Acts that Paul writes Galatians very early. And then we get to the, the letters to the church in Thessalonica. And so, again, if we, if we put them in chronological order, that would be very confusing. I like the logical way they're arranged in our Bibles now, as long as we're aware that you don't have to read your New Testament by starting with page 1, Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, and read through the end of Revelation. That's not how the books were written and delivered to the church anyway. It's not bad if you want to do that, but does anyone know, by the way, the, why are the, Paul's letters in the order they're in? What, what logic did they use to put Paul... Why, why would Romans be first if he wrote... Gal why didn't they put Galatians first if he wrote that first? And then why didn't they put First and Second Thessalonians and then put them in 
the order in which they were written. And, it, and since they didn't, why are they in that order? So here's a, little, here's a little trivia for you. They're in order of length. So Romans, 16 chapters, 1 Corinthians, 16, 2 Corinthians, 13, right? Galatians 6, Ephesians 6. Now, the, the exception is when you get to, they group the pastorals together. So when you have Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, the, the, uh, those have four, uh, have four, right? Philippians, Colossians have four chapters each. And then when you get to the first Timothy, though, there are six. So, but that's because they group the pastoral letters together, which makes sense. But they're in generally in order of the length of the letters. So that's why Philemon is tacked on right there before Hebrews. And then Hebrews is put there because we're not sure if that's one of Paul's letters. Anyway, that's 13 chapters. If we knew that was from Paul, it might, we'd put it, I suppose they would have put it earlier. All right, so then what? Then what? So you, you can buzz in here with your buzzer. All right, then we think very early on around this time, the first gospel is written, which I believe was Mark and that Matthew and Luke use Mark as a source. We talked about that in our class. So then uh, Paul writes these letters to the, to the church at Corinth. Are you impressed with my little, my little graphics here, how they're moving? Okay, yeah, oh, there's some, ooh, and thank you, thank you. Um, all right, so we, we studied these out of order. We looked at Romans, and now we're looking at First and Second Corinthians. And now, notice there's a broad time range in which Hebrews may have been written, but the earliest time would be around uh, a few years after Romans was written. And then Peter's first letter, and then Paul's prison epistles dur during his first imprisonment in Rome. There's the prison epistles, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. So now, now you, should have, you should have all these others checked off, and now it's easier to fill in wh where the rest would be. But um, Luke and Acts, right? Luke part one and Luke part two, as you often hear me refer to them. Uh, and then Matthew, again, may have already been written well before this point, but the later date would have been uh, the later end of the spectrum where we're dating Matthew would have been uh, after Luke Acts. But um, then we get to Paul's time of release after he was released from that first imprisonment when he writes 1 Timothy and Titus. And then uh, we can put Peter's second letter here and the book of Jude. Again, now these are estimates and there's some conjecture here. But then Paul, before he was executed in his second imprisonment, his final words... Um, that we have in 2 Timothy. And then we get to the letters of John, finally. Uh, la the last to write, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And then the Gospel of John. So the letters uh, may have been written first, and then the Gospel of John, and then the book of Revelation. I don't know if that was interesting or helpful to anyone, but um, I, I think it does help us kind of break out of a simplistic way of looking at the, the New Testament to think of, try to imagine being in the early church and as the, you can't just pull out your Bible like we have it today and these documents are being written and so when you hear the church, when you hear as you gather in one of the house churches in Corinth and you hear this letter that Paul wrote to the church read to the church, maybe you can't even read and you hear it read to the church, you don't have the other New Testament documents against which to compare it likely uh, on its first reading. So, and as we always do then, let's look at some historical background. And with, you know, with some New Testament letters, there's not a whole lot that we can gather to get uh, a detailed look at, at the backdrop of, uh, of those letters. But with 1 Corinthians, there is a wealth of information we can draw on that sheds tremendous light on the text itself. So that's why it's worth doing this carefully, especially with 1 Corinthians. So how do we even have a congregation in Corinth to begin with? Well, the Bible tells us about this church and its establishment. And I say churches here, the origin of the, uh, the Corinthian 
church is plural because um, it's written to the church, singular in Corinth, but most likely there were house churches as we see. We, we mentioned at the end of the book of Romans, we looked at the references to the churches that, the church that met in, in the house of so-and-so of these different individuals. So Paul, uh, on his second missionary journey, goes into Macedonia, northern Greece, what we today would call Greece, and then into Greece proper, um, and then finally makes his way through those cities, you know, um, Berea, Philippi, Thessalonica, and then he comes down to Corinth, and we read about that in Acts 18. And here, so this is where we are. This is the part of the map where we, we find ourselves right here. So I'm going to show you the map of his journey here in just a minute. So you can see Rome, where Rome would be uh, over in, uh, in Italy. And um, you can see Jerusalem, right? Let me get this <laughs> over here. So um, and Paul's journey would have started in Antioch. We can see that here in a map. Uh, yeah, that I've got right here. So let's, let's watch what he did here. So he left, as we've been noticing from our study in Acts. So he leaves from Antioch and goes, whoop, that's way too thick. He leaves from Antioch and goes through southern Galatia and revisits the churches that he and Barnabas established on their first missionary journey. And you remember, they were forbidden to speak the word in Asia at that time, which would be here. This is uh, modern day Turkey, right? And so they move uh, across, they receive the Macedonian call and go into Philippi. I mentioned these in the wrong order earlier. Thessalonica and Berea, and then they come down into, there's Macedonia, Greece proper, or Achaia, uh, as you'll see it referred to by Paul. And then down here we get finally to Corinth, and then later he's going to return and go to Ephesus. That's where he's writing from. We'll see uh, when he when he arrives there later on a second visit, he'll write to them, and then he returns to Jerusalem, and then goes eventually goes back up uh, to Antioch. So let's read about what happened when this church was established, because this will help us too. So we're going to go since we're studying First Corinthians naturally. I'm we're, we're reading from Acts. No, this makes sense. Trust me, this makes sense. So. What happens then, um, as Paul is being pursued and persecuted as he moves through the churches in Macedonia, notice that after this, Paul uh, and left Athens. So we have Paul's speech at, and on Mars Hill on Areopagus in Athens, the college town, the university town, with the philosophers there, and he moves on into Corinth. So it's, this, is a, this is a much different environment in certain respects. And he found a Jew named Aquila, and I was saying Aquila, I think either way is acceptable. When we were Romans, I kept saying Aquila, and some of you might have thought that was really odd sounding. But uh, uh, Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. Now, we have historical records of this edict, and this is why we can pinpoint with some accuracy when Paul was there and when these letters were written, and you'll see why I'm giving it the date that I'm giving here in a moment. So, because Luke gives us these uh, rich historical details. So, you ima imagine being of a certain ethnicity, imagine being a Jew, and, uh, and there's a declaration that everyone of your race has to leave this city, has to, has to up and, and leave your home, leave your community, and, and flee uh, the city. Uh, it's really traumatic, and uh, think of the ordeal that that presented, but think of how God used it to bring Paul together with uh, Aquila and Priscilla. In verse 3, and because Paul was of the same trade, he went to see them, and because, or, I'm sorry, verse 3, because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers. Now, they may have already been Christians at, at this point, or Paul may have converted him. That's not clear to me, um, but um, they were tent makers by trade. So Paul's working with his hands to support himself to get by so that he can preach the gospel. So he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. But now, remember, he's, he's gone on ahead from Silas and Timothy, his companions on this trip. So they finally catch up with him. And notice this, verse 5, when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia... 
Paul was occupied with the work. See, there's a change here now where he's not occupied with making tents. Now he can give himself fully to teaching the word. Why? Because Silas and Timothy, we learn from comparing from from second Corinthians and from Philippians. We learn they brought money. They brought support from the churches of Macedonia through Philippi, like a sponsoring church arrangement, collecting funds for Paul. And Silas and Timothy arrived with funds so he can now give himself to preaching the word. It's testifying to the Jews that, Jesus, uh, that Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him. So this is the, the background for this church in Corinth. Opposition at first. He shook out his garments and he said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. So he left there. And he went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God, for his house was next door to the synagogue. And they must not have liked Paul here. The Jews are persecuting him, and he's, he's in the household of someone right next to the synagogue. And Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. So this is, even though the Jews were opposing Paul, this is quite significant that, that the ruler of the synagogue is converted. So this is an important beginning here for the church. And then he tells us many of the Corinthians hearing Paul believed uh, and, and were baptized. So, uh, so here we've got uh, Crispus, his, whole, his entire household. Uh, here we have uh, then the, the nascent Corinthian congregation. So verse 9, the Lord said to Paul, now this is, this is a moving moment here. The Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you. What a, wow, what a powerful message. When we're, when we're afraid to speak up for the Lord, when we're intimidated, don't be afraid, I am with you. Now, we don't always have this promise, and Paul didn't always have it either. But he says here, I'm with you, and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many people. I have many people, I have many in this city. I'm going by the translation I'd memorized a long time ago, this text, uh, the ASV. For I have many in this city who are my people. The ASV says, I have much people in this city. Uh, so I have many in this city who are my people. See, the Lord knew there would be a great response to the gospel here. So he wants Paul to stay and preach. So he stayed now. This is unusual for Paul. Here he stays and preaches for... 18 months, a year and six months teaching the Word of God among them. Now, what I, what I want you to remember about that is this, this seems incredible because Paul writes to the church and, seems, it, it, and it seems their understanding. He says, I've got to write to you like babies and not like men who need milk and not meat. And he said, I'm writing to you as carnal, as fleshly and not spiritual. And he's correcting all kinds of misunderstandings and errors that are being propagated among them and accepted among them. And so it shows you, even with the Apostle Paul right there in their midst, teaching them for a year and six months, there's still a lot of growing and a lot of learning to do. We, there's still, it, it still takes a lot of teaching and a lot of time, doesn't it, for some of us to grow. You would think if Paul was there that long, you wouldn't think a letter like 1 Corinthians with all the problems and errors you know, you, you we wouldn't think we'd see all those conditions uh, in a letter to a church like this. But that, that's quite revealing in and of itself. But now what happens? But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, so again, Greece here, and we have historical records indicating to us when Gallio was proconsul. Again, this is why I'm dating the letter around 53 or 54 A.D. The Jews made a united attack on Paul. So he's been there a year and a half. And they've hated him the whole while, and now they finally muster uh, an attack against him. So they, they brought him before the tribunal, and that's what the enemies of the gospel would do again and again. We see in Acts, they use the civil authorities. They use the power of the state to persecute the church. So they brought him before the tr tribunal saying, This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, I like this gesture, <laughs> He's about to talk and he gets cut off. Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing, 
or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it's a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, he didn't care about the Jews' religion and their internal, their internecine disputes and, and all of that. He, he didn't, he wasn't there as the Roman proconsul to pass judgment on their disputes of this nature, as long as it didn't disrupt the public peace. But that's, of course, what they would, they would charge and uh, eventually, but so notice uh, it's, 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 a, it's a question about words and names in your own law. See to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. It'd be sort of like being taken to court and standing before the judge and saying, uh, Your Honor, Joe taught uh, th that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, and I don't think Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. Um, uh, would you throw him in jail? I mean, can you imagine a judge, uh, of course, I'm using a very trivial example, but can you imagine coming before the civil authorities and making a religious charge like that? And, but of course, this was affecting the whole community life here. The gospel's making uh, an impact in inroads. And so notice he drove them from the tribunal. And then here's this irony. They all seized Soth Sosthenes, and this could be a different Sosthenes, but it it might be the same one mentioned in 1 Corinthians who is, ends up being converted. But the ruler of the synagogue, and they beat, <laughs> they beat him in front of the tribunal. So it appears that since their attack backfired, that it was an ill-advised attempt. Now they're angry. Look at how they turn. And they're angry with the ruler of the synagogue uh, because it failed. They beat him. So they drag him out and give him a beating and Gallio, uh, Gallio paid no attention to any of this. And your Bible might say he cared for none of these things. So it, it, it could be interpreted to mean he didn't like it, but I think it's, what it's saying is he, didn't, he was totally indifferent toward it. And he was indifferent toward what they were saying about Paul. And so after this, then verse 18 says, Paul stayed many days longer. So for, he, he extended his stay even beyond unless Luke's giving a summary statement earlier about the year and six months. And then he took leave of the brothers and he set sail for Syria and with him Priscilla and Aquila. And, then, and so there, there we have the origin uh, of the church. So let's think about the date. Uh, and I know some of this is kind of mundane. You say, well, I want to get to the stuff that's going to help me be a better Christian this week. I, I, I want some encouragement, some edification. Uh, I want to increase my knowledge of God and his will. So why are we bogged down in all this? Well, it's it, it all helps us ultimately in our total understanding of the New Testament documents. So thanks for bearing with some of this kind of uh, the tedious detail. But the providence just means the place from which it was written. Now, w this is complicated because Paul wrote, how many letters did Paul write to the church at Corinth? The trick question. So you look in your Bibles and you say 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, right? So, I see that's, that's one, that's two letters. No, he, he wrote four, at least four letters to the church at Corinth. Now, the canonical letters, that's what we would call the ones that, you know, in our Bible, First and Second Corinthians, have been preserved and we have them. But uh, Paul made a number of visits, wrote a number of letters. The first visit we just read about when he planted the church, and again, because we know when Gallio was proconsul, we can look at the inscriptions, the historical records. And so we can say that was around 50 to 52 that Paul was there. So then he, he wrote them a letter. Now, how do we know he wrote this letter that we don't have? Because in 1 Corinthians, the one we're calling his first one is really his second one. Because in that one, he says, I wrote to you. In 1 Corinthians 5, he says, past tense, I already wrote to you about something. Well, we don't have that. We don't have everything that Paul wrote. We have what God one and preserved for us and we have all that we need to know the will of God but so we sometimes call that the lost letter uh, and then as as um, Paul then returns to Antioch and goes out on his second missionary tour and he arrives and works for some time in Ephesus in Acts 19 then he writes 1 Corinthians I'm gonna say around 53 to, to 54 he writes that first letter and at some time in there, he makes a second visit because in 2 Corinthians, he talks about a visit that was painful uh, for, 
for them, that was painful for him to make, that was where he is having to confront them about some of these difficult things. And so he refers to a visit in there that we don't have a record of. And also in 2 Corinthians, then, he writes of a severe letter that he wrote to them. Now, some people would say, well, that's 1 Corinthians. But I, I think it's another letter that we don't have, and many scholars think it's another letter. Um, and so they'd, they'd say you've got the lost letter A, 1 Corinthians, and then this one is uh, Corinthians B, and then you've got 2 Corinthians. But, so he refers to a number of times having already written to them, but then as he makes his way back for yet another visit, he writes 2 Corinthians from Macedonia um, uh, probably about a year later, and then he finally arrives at, on his third visit. We read about that in Acts 20, but Luke doesn't tell us much about it. Well, that gives us a chance then to talk about the actual city because knowing something about the city helps us make sense of why the Corinthians thought the way they did about the things that Paul's addressing and correcting some of their misunderstandings, some of the cultural context. I, I can't think of another New Testament book where knowing the details of the cultural context is more helpful in opening up understanding to the contents of the letter. It's, it, that's helpful when you study Ephesians. It helps when you're looking at the pastoral letters and such, but it really opens up so much for us here. So. We need to understand when you talk about the city of Corinth there, first of all, there was an ancient Greek Corinth or classical Corinth um, going back centuries before the time that Paul was there. And that ancient classical uh, Corinth was they resisted Rome. So when Rome ruled the Med takes over the Mediterranean, they, they gave Ro Rome resistance. And so the, the city was destroyed. And Julius Caesar comes along and rebuilds. He decides he wants to make a, a, a city there on that site again and rebuilds Corinth. And that is in the uh, around, uh, I'll say about 100 years then before the time that Paul is there. And so there's a huge time span there. And there's a great difference in well, there, there are some significant differences in the cultural context. So you got to be careful when you're reading historical references to Corinth. Well, was it, was it Roman Corinth when Paul was there? When you're reading something Strabo says about how the Corinthians lived and the way they acted, and you say, ah, I see, that's why Paul said this in 1 Corinthians. Well, was he, well, wait a minute, was he talking about ancient Greek Corinth, or was he talking about the new Corinth, modern Corinth, or the one that was the Roman colony? Because if you Google uh, Corinth, you're going to see the remains of the Temple of Apollo. And that was part of the ancient of Greek Corinth. And the, you, see, you can see here, by the way, look at, uh, look at the hill. There's, there you see the, 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 the uh, Temple to Apollo in the foreground. And then that massive hill is... The, is the Acropolis or the Acro Corinth, the hill uh, from uh, the original ancient Greek city. And that temple of Apollos was rebuilt by the Romans or repurposed, I guess you could say, and made a, 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 a place for the imperial cult, for the worship of Rome. <laughs> but that was ancient Greek Corinth. And understanding, and then this is where we'll stop, Understanding the geography is, is very, very important because of, because of its location, because of where it was situated, Corinth was a very prosperous city. It was a, a mercantile uh, economy. It was a crossroads where goods moved from the Gulf of Corinth uh, across to the, to the Mediterranean, and so you wouldn't have to circumvent around the Peloponnese Peninsula. And so because of that, there's a lot of wealth. There's a lot of ostentatious display of wealth, a lot of pursuit of wealth, pursuit of power, pursuit of status. There's a lot going on because of, see, the theology of 1 Corinthians actually relates to the geography 
of, of the place. Because we're going to see how that affected that worldliness, how all that affected the thinking of the saints in Corinth and how Paul is having to correct them because they're more influenced. Let me say this, and this is what we'll talk about next time. They're, they're in Corinth, and the church is in Corinth, uh, and Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, but there's too much of Corinth in the church. And so we see him addressing the fact that their thinking was being shaped more by the culture than by Christ. And you hear me say that all the time about the church now in our day. And I'm going to mention this next time. Let me just close on this interesting thing. I just saw in the news last night. Did anybody see this? A church in Houston had a drag show had a drag performance. Did you see that? And I think even children were welcome to come to this sexual, this display of sexual perversion and moral degeneracy. Now, how does a, how does a church, how does a body of people claiming to be Christian endorse that? Would anybody have thought of that 80 years ago, 100 years? No, it's the culture. They're living like the culture. And that's what we see Paul addressing with the Corinthians in this letter. And a lot of the culture had to do with where Corinth was located. So we'll talk about that next time. So I hope you're looking forward to continuing the study. Thanks for letting me walk through this carefully with you. Appreciate the extra couple minutes. God bless you this morning.